Okay. All right, cool. Well, let us um, keep going. Okay. Uh, first thing I want to, so today we're going to uh, start and then it'll, we'll, we'll continue it on until um, in the future. But um, today I want to start talking about um, one of, so, so again, our definition of the coastal zone, broadly writ. We're talking about the area of the land that's directly influenced by the sea and the sea influenced by the land, etc. cetera. Um, but because we're fairly familiar with stuff on land, I want to spend a little bit of time and just go in a little more in depth into some basic oceanography, some basic marine ecology type stuff, since that is um, distant and, and unfamiliar for most of us, so that we kind of do a little bit of balancing out so we can talk about these challenges and have some uh, decent grounding um, in terms of uh, our understanding of the ocean parts of the world. So I want to start that conversation with just some, some logistics. So some talking about the different areas or how we refer to different parts of the world ocean. And again, uh, I'm just I'm just lecturing here. I have my Zoom on. So if you guys have a question, you can throw stuff in the chat, but I, I can't, it's hard for me to read the chat as we're doing this. So um, by all means, just unmute and, and interrupt me or say, hey, Dr. A, can you explain that? Or I didn't, I didn't get that, uh, that thing. Cool. All right, let us go. Okay, so uh, for this initial part here, I want to talk about geographies that are relevant to our management questions or, or our conservation challenges. Um, and so my first question to you guys, or, or firstly, I want to uh, show this little clip. So this was from a documentary this weekend, the anniversary of 9-11. Uh, this documentary is actually from the 10th anniversary um, of uh, 9 11, but I'll just play it real quick. That was a, a new reality. One of the things that changed on September the 11th is the notion that we're protected by oceans. In the past, uh, in place in remote lands, we felt pretty secure at home. So, um, so that was uh, former President Bush talking um, about the ocean in, unfortunately, I would say a relatively ignorant way and a way that I think is common among uh, many folks. But this notion that um, notions, or, excuse me, this notion that oceans are these massive spaces that are buffers, that are protectors that are differentiators between continents and, and all this and that. Oceans are extremely structured things. They're extremely complex things. And that, that notion of uh, the sea as this vast, open, endless uh, uh, barrier is really an ignorant view and is really an old view. And so we really now have different perceptions of this part of our planet. Um, and, uh, but it's understandable why President Bush and other folks uh, maybe would, would have this. And that's because they're, we are terrestrial beings. You are terrestrial, are a terrestrial being. And so we take a lot of our orientation, a lot of our understanding, a lot of our um, conceptualizations of the world from our experience living in essentially a two-dimensional uh, plane um, with uh, soil underneath us, air on top of us, plants around us, that kind of stuff. And so there's, there's, a, there's a different geography of land versus geography of sea. Somebody, yeah, so somebody had a question. No, okay. Um, so for example, when we talk about our, the terrestrial realm and when we talk about management level or management um, relevant geographies, maps, and, and how we conceptualize these, these regions, they're often a political or legal construct. And so here we go. So here we're looking at a satellite image, a NASA image of Los Angeles at night. And so it's very dramatic. We can see all of our streets. We can see these, these large um, 
uh, industrial activities, residential activities, et cetera. There's a little bit of dark up here where the San Gabriel Mountains are. There's a bit of dark here where the Santa Monica is. And there's tons of dark, obviously, out here in the ocean. Our common um, things that we think about. Uh, oh well, let me ask you guys. So tell me, tell me some of the common. Um, tell me maybe some of the common political constructs or legal constructs we might use to to do management on land. Any ideas? Or or categorizations of the land that we use maybe in terms of doing management planning or conservation work. Everybody's asleep still. Everybody's recovering from the earthquake still. No, we just don't want to be wrong. <laughs> no, just, just, just toss it out. No, it's all good. Just toss out whatever. All right, what do you, give me an idea. What about like housing, divvying up area for housing versus? Yeah, totally. So okay. zoning, you know, you know, traditional zoning laws and things and, and um, boundaries. So this is a an urban area. This is a, um, a manufacturing area. This is an agricultural area. Exactly. Yeah. Perfect. Other other ideas or other examples you guys can think of. Legal definitions of what we can do in one place versus another place. Like counties. Sure, sure, right. Yeah. So 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 we have we have um, country level laws. We have um, state level laws. We have county level laws and ordinances and zoning, and um, and and city or, or or town. Yeah, totally good. Any other ones you guys think of? I'm looking at this picture, it reminds me of there's um, dark sky reserves. Yep. Yeah, so so some guidance based on the amount of light that's around, right? So so categorizing areas by the amount of light pollution that's there or the amount of light pollution that is not there. Cool, good. Other Other ideas? I can't think of the technical name, but you know how we have to do like an ecological impact survey before we build anything. Yeah. Yep. Totally. And I'll show an example of that in a second. Perfect. Any other ones people are thinking about? So here's one. Here's one common one. So these, this is um, a map of wetlands, um, what we call jurisdictional wetlands, which meet the legal definition under uh, section 404 of uh, the Clean Water Act. And so you can take our, our restoration ecology class if you guys wanna learn, learn more in depth about the definitions of wetlands, but it essentially is a three-part definition. And, and, and that legally delineates a quote unquote wetland from another area, from the upland area. And so that's a, that's a place. So for example, we could talk about management concerns or planning or challenges based on the stuff in the purple zone, right? So which is our riparian and, and wetland areas. So that's one way to think about it. Another one um, that we've actually been one of the pioneers uh, with regards to this here in Ventura County. And when I first moved to Ventura County, got all kinds of calls from uh, folks in Florida and other places around the country, um, both because of our um, SOAR initiative, Save Our Open Space and Agricultural Resources Initiative, which is a zoning planning tool, but then also this, which was just coming up at the time, which was wildlife corridors. So this is a county level overlay, and this is distinct, this is designated areas that are important for terrestrial animal movement, large vertebrate movement across the landscape. And so you'll see there's some overlap with the wetlands and, and the riparian corridors. We see right here, here's the Santa Clara River. And so there's, there's um, uh, you know, some, some of that is the same area. But then we have these important connections where we go from, you know, one mountain range to another mountain range or go for a, 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 from a relatively undisturbed area through a relatively disturbed area to another relatively undisturbed area, et cetera. So wetlands, wildlife corridors. And then uh, the most relevant one for us that we'll uh, touch on here, and then we'll, we'll pivot and start to talk about the marine stuff. This is so-called ESHA. So, that, so rarely do people say the full name here. They'll just use the acronym E-S-H-A. 
A, and that's environmentally sensitive habitat areas. This is a designation under the uh, California Coastal Act. And so again, we've, we've, again, we're not going into depth yet about the Coastal Commission, but this is another Coastal Commission related thing. And this, uh, this is related to regions within the coastal zone. And as you remember before uh, our last pre presentation, our last lecture, we talked about the fact that um, this uh, uh, area varies, right? So in some cases it's very, very narrow. In other cases, it's quite extensive. And so, so within that coastal zone, there are, are areas where um, we believe have important um, consideration for uh, and, and should have an impact on things like development and the type of activities we do in or next to that area. And so um, the definition of ESHA is this. It, it is referring to any geography in which plant or animal life or their habitats are either rare or especially valuable because of their special nature or role in an ecosystem and which could easily be disturbed or degraded by human activities and human development. So that's a, that, that, that's a short definition, but it's kind of amorphous, right? Because what do we mean by special nature? And what do we mean especially valuable? And what do we mean by easily disturbed? But, but we're not gonna go into that today, but just suffice it to say, ESHA is thing, or, or classic things that include ESHA would, would be a wetland, a wetland would be an ESHA, um, or it could include something like coastal sage scrub, right? A plant community that, that used to be very, very expansive. And then where we like to put houses in and developments, it's, it's shrunk. It could be the, the geography of an endangered plant, like an endangered Dudleya or other plant we have. Um, again, in and around campus that used to be all across our region, but because of activities, the distribution of that organism has sort of shrunk. And so, so ESHA is one example. So, so we have on land, we typically do things like you guys were all mentioning, zoning, um, uh, wet, we define wetlands by a legal definition. Um, we define ESHA under this legal definition of, of um, this area, et cetera. So that's, the, that's the, our typical experience on land. Question so far, make sense? Okay, so now let's, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about stuff in the ocean. So in the ocean, because there's fewer people, um, and there's one huge thing. So, so what's one huge thing from a legal context that we have on land that we don't have in the ocean? Any, any ideas? Say in the United States or in California, uh, an aspect, a legal aspect that is going on in a terrestrial environment that doesn't exist in the, in the underwater world. Private property. Exactly, exactly. So um, here, right, one of the challenges for this exact thing, right, it says, blah, 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 easily disturbed by or degraded by human activities and developments, right? We do developments because we have a tradition in our society, in our, in our country, of private ownership of land, and then I can sell this land to someone and theoretically that person can do what they want to do in that land actually you can't right you can't you can't put up a prison and torture people for example but but nevertheless the, the, this idea of it's it's my land i get to do what i want is very much baked into our political system in our in our history of our country that doesn't really exist on land so while we do have some legal constructs to define areas and define geographies in the ocean um, they are more general so you don't get these widely detailed maps. You don't get, you don't get maps like this, uh, generally speaking, in the ocean. So we have some more general legal construct, constructs that will define areas, <clears throat> but also really key, the natural environment is going to um, provide most of our definitions and most of our boundaries and most of our locations and how, how we break those locations up. 
And so, um, so the, as, as we look here at, at Santa Monica at night and start to transition to the ocean, the first thing I want to um, highlight to you guys is this cartoon. Now, this is an exaggerated cartoon. So this is, this is not um, exactly right, but this is just helpful in terms of beginning to wrap our heads around some of these areas. So the dark area, the black at the top there, that's the air. That's the, that's the land and air parts of the world. And then we, we hit the white to the blue, that's the water world. Okay, so this is a, a cartoon of the ocean. We have these key parts of our global ocean. And so the, the rock, the sediment, the, the hard parts, the bottom of the ocean start on land and continue off into the water on what we refer to as a continental shelf. So this is essentially the same thing as is on campus, the same thing as is in the Santa Monica Mountains, et cetera. It's just the water is, is lying on top of that. So we go to a continental shelf, and then we hit this slope area, and then, uh, which is sort of like a big cliff, not, not, not a straight up and down cliff, but you know, a, a, an area where stuff can fall down quite easily. The, st the area where that falling down stuff accumulates, the, the toe, the rubble buildup at the bottom is called the continental rise. And then we get to the main flat area of the ocean. And this is the most common area, um, ge uh, uh, geology, the most common, common surface geology on earth. So when we look at the entirety of the planet, most of the planet is abyssal plain or is ocean plain. The terms rise, slope, shelf come from the perspective, from oceanographer's perspective, as if you were in a submarine moving around the most common area of the planet, the abyssal plain, and you were motoring and you started heading towards um, the continent, started heading towards California, let's say, okay? So we're going, 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 we're puttering, puttering, puttering. And then we have this rise, this little bit of rise off the bottom. That's, what, that's where the term comes from. And then we start going up a fairly steep slope. So that's the continental slope there. And then we get to a, a leveling off. And so that's where we get the term continental shelf. Uh, these depths here of 200 meters, 2003, these are just sort of generic. They're, they're, not, they're not exact everywhere. It's gonna vary depending on the specific geography. Every so often in this uh, plane of the world's ocean, there is a gouge, there is a tear, there is a rip. Um, and these are uh, trenches. And so these go quite deep. In fact, the deepest spot in the ocean is the Marianas Trench, is one of these rents and openings on the, on the crust there. Uh, we also have uh, islands which um, can uh, be built up over millions of years. So Hawaii and the Hawaiian Islands are an example of this, where we have out of the flat part of the abyssal plain, you have this giant mountain coming up. And so those are volcanic islands. And then we do have areas uh, similarly where we have uh, land, uh, either um, uh, tectonic plates smashing together or, or somehow other, uh, coming apart and rubbing against each other. And so we can get a, um, essentially a stitch, a, a stitch across the middle. And so that would be a, a relatively large uh, ridge. The volcanic islands are points, whoop, points that pop up from the oceanic, or from the abyssal plain, excuse me. The submarine ridge is essentially a mountain range that pokes up from the abyssal plain. Uh, and so, so the, this is so this is what I just sort of uh, mentioned to you. So here's some some terms for you. Uh, so continents, you guys know what the continents are, right? The continental shelf. Um, most of the shelf was at one point in the air, um, and so erosive properties happened by things like rain and wind. Not now. They might be uh, uh, currents and, and tides might be influencing the erosion, but it, at some point in the past the continental shelf was um, exposed to the air. The continental slope, as I mentioned, is relatively steep, somewhere between one and 15 degrees, depending on where we're talking about uh, on, uh, on the earth. 
the the long term average is is about four degrees. So the typical thing is about a four degree. Now you might think four degrees doesn't seem like a lot. That that's that's pretty big um, when you when you spread out over the the lengths that we're talking about, um, and and that leads to a fairly deep uh, increase in depth. Okay, uh, again, the continental rise is just the toe at the bottom of the slope where essentially stuff that's, that erodes off the top or tumbles off the top goes down and, and builds up at the bottom. The plain I mentioned is the flat area. The oceanic ridges are these mountain ranges, and then we have these trenches. Um, and this is a little bit of a cartoon. This is from the East Coast, but I, I, I like this cartoon because it sort of gives, I think, more of a, a, a a good perspective where here the purple would be the terrestrial uh, world, right? Where you and I are most familiar with. That's the thing that um, President Bush said, oh, you know, we thought the ocean was a big barrier, right? The ocean is, is very complex. And so um, simply because the current sea level is the level that we are at is uh, defines where this purple and beige line is. But with sea level rise, with sea, sea level drop, you get you could potentially have this purple line being you know kind of anywhere around here but then at some point we leave that relatively consistent um shelf area and that's when we hit the the slope etc now these areas that we have in the ocean we can define by a couple different ways so we're going to wrap up by just talking about two Different to the broad pa patterns. One is the is political or treaty or legal, um, and the next is is the nature stuff. So let's talk about the treaty stuff. So here are four terms that you might hear uh, used to refer to different regions of the ocean. Uh, one would be territorial seas. One would be uh, exclusive economic zone. Virtually no one says that. They mo mostly say EEZ, the acronym. Uh, you also will hear uh, outer continental shelf. Oftentimes people will abbreviate that by OCS. Um, and then in recent years, people have started talking about extended continental shelf. Um, and so that's a sort of relatively new thing. Um, as far as territorial seas, this basically means... Um, um, essentially within my political realm. So, I, so it's my territory. Um, because of that, it's, it's a very mushy old term. We don't really use that much anymore. And it's highly flubbable. It's highly dependent on the context. And so that's, again, one of the reasons why we don't use it too much. It could refer to, um, say, a state's a state um, area of the ocean. It could refer to a country's area of the ocean. It could refer to the country's traditional area of the ocean, et cetera. So territorial seas you might hear, but, but generally speaking, avoid that word. Use a more precise term as we're going uh, forward. EEZ, this is the area that is, um, and we'll talk about this um, in, a little, in a bit, but, but this is the area where um, in the modern world, countries exhibit control and say, I control these fisheries, I control the oil and gas extraction, I control the shipping uh, in this area, and this is uh, 200 nautical miles um, from the mean higher high water, typically. Uh, uh, and that's, and until, unless we bump up against another country. So if we were in a place like uh, the Mediterranean Sea or something of that nature where we could not go 200 nautical miles because we'd bump into somebody else's territory, then by treaty, it, the, the EEZ might be less than 200 nautical miles. But in areas where, say, we pick Hawaii, which is just an island and there's, there's no other countries around it, no other islands around it, um, uh, it's just going to go out 200 nautical miles. And that, that defines the EEZ there. Um, the outer continental shelf is the area beyond three nautical miles that's still on the shelf, but yet it's, it's beyond three nautical miles from mean high or high water. And then extended continental shelf is an area that uh, people want to go beyond the 200 nautical mile limit. 
Okay, uh, so real quick, so people asked this last time, we our, our last lecture, and so I wanted to give you guys a little more detail. So we use, for many of these legal definitions in the ocean, we use nautical mile. And that's unfortunate, but it's what we have. Um, so I've looked into, some people asked why we're using that, and I said, oh, it's just because we always use, but that was kind of a lame answer. So I, I looked into it. The, the real, or the origin was, uh, is math. So the origin is um, taking the, the earth, right? Dividing it or cir a circle say, uh, dividing it into 360 degrees and then further dividing those degrees into minutes, et cetera. So um, a nautical mile was one minute or one 60th of a degree of latitude. So that, that's, where we, that's where it came into being. It turned out it was close to what we would call a mile. Nowadays, as with everything, we've standardized it. And so now we have a precise measure. And so now it, it, one nautical mile equals exactly 1.852 uh, kilometers or 1,852 meters. And that's uh, 6,076 feet or 1.151 statutory mile, okay? So one nautical mile is about 1.15 quote unquote regular miles. Now, because nautical mile is, is rarely used, we don't use this typically in, in academic research. We don't use this in uh, engineering uh, circles and things of that nature. Um, so as a consequence, we, we do not have an, which is unusual, we, but we do not have an internationally agreed upon symbol like we do for feet, like we do for kilometers, that kind of stuff. So as a consequence, depending on what graph you look at, they're going to use different terms to denote or, or, or old publication in a book somewhere. They're going to use potentially different term or different abbreviations for nautical mile. They might use capital M, they might use capital N, M, all these different examples. And so, um, so just be aware of that. In our class, I'll try to use lowercase n, lowercase m, just to be, just to be consistent. But I'll show you one figure I just lifted. Uh, for the for our talk today and it, it uses this capital m but when we use it all in explanations or, or detailing um uh examples to you guys i'll try to use n m and so that's what we have here so this is a cool figure that i borrowed from the international Hyd hydrographic organization they use the capital m so i overwrote it with my little n and m's to, to be hopefully cleared for, for you guys but here you go so here's an example of um, the shelf versus the slope. Um, so again, dry land is up here, terrestrial areas here. We have this broad shelf region. We hit the slope, it drops off. We, and then we have this toe, this buildup of erosive material at the bottom. And then we hit the, uh, the uh, abyssal plain and then it goes on for a while. Um, so uh, the 200, and, and and so the 200 nautical miles, it's going to vary, right? It's going to depend on which continent we're talking about as to whether that 200 nautical miles hits the continental shelf, whether it hits the slope, whether it hits the rise or what have you. So this is just an example. This particular example is from Brazil, but it, you know, you guys get the idea. So, um, so you know, 200 nautical miles, that's going to be our EEZ, our exclusive economic zone. Um, and uh, there are different areas. And so because some of these folks are talking about, um, you know, this extended area, this extended area beyond 200 nautical miles, there's some different proposals for how we might define that and, and, and come to an understanding. That's still, uh, still being decided by countries. So we don't have an exact definition, but, but this is just uh, to give you a sense of, of scale of these different things. Um, and so in this, this representation, um, they're using capital M to mean nautical mile. The lowercase m here refers to meters. So again, we have some dry land, we go through some um, uh, continental shelf, we start to hit the slope, we go down, we have the rise, and then we have the, the ocean floor here. Um, and depending on what area we're talking about uh, in, in which, the, the ocean area off of which continent we're talking about, the 200 nautical miles could hit the continental shelf or it could hit the abyssal plain. Um, that's relevant because as we'll see in a bit, uh, we'll probably, won't have, probably won't get to it today, but we'll see next time um, when we talk about deep sea mining, 
there is some interest in, in pulling resources off the bottom of the ocean. And many of those resources are different on the abyssal plain versus the continental shelf. So there's also some people that have interest in extending this um, zone of national influence or national control farther out to capture some of the um, broader parts of the deep ocean, both in terms of mineral resources as well as biological resources. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, so this is what our, um, this just gives you just a, a little quick example of what our EEZ looks like. So here is our terrestrial world. And then our, our 200 nautical miles exclusive economic zone is this uh, gray area that continues out into the ocean. So from a legal standpoint, all of the United States of America's laws are applicable in all the gray. It doesn't matter if you're on land or at sea, right? So if you murder someone and you are in this gray area, you're subjected to the same federal prosecution potentially as you are over here. If we were out here in this non-gray area, then you would be in the open ocean, right? Then you'd be beyond what's called beyond national boundaries or beyond national borders. So that's uh, pirate land. That's that's you know out in the middle of uh, the, the so-called high seas. Cool. Okay. So the last uh, last one I want to spend in terms of just making sure we have these these terms and these ideas and geographies down is to talk about um, the areas by essentially basic location, basic uh, natural history and geography. And so these are all some things we can, we can slice the ocean up and these are all, depending on the, the audience and, and the management situation, we might use these uh, differentiators. One is um, neuritic versus oceanic. Um, which is um, uh, uh, near the um, near land versus far away from land, pelagic versus benthic. Benthic is associated with a surface, so near, say, the bottom of the ocean, and pelagic is up in the water column. We can also talk about um, terms for organisms who are self-powered primarily and, and, and move wherever the heck they want to versus critters that are moved primarily by um, the forces of moving water. Okay, so currents taking them different places. We can also talk about being next to or far from an edge. And we can also talk about being in the lighted regions of the world ocean versus in the um, perennial darkness of the bottom of the ocean. And so let me show you what I mean by those. So here's some terms uh, for uh, where we are based on the region that we're talking about. Okay, so here we go. So here we have the littoral or the coastal zone, okay? The area that's above mean higher high water is above the tide line. And so we would call that supra tidal, excuse me, above the tides. The area between the highest high tide and the lowest low tide, that's the intertidal. So that's the between tide region. And then the area that is below the lowest tide, that would be subtidal. As we start going farther down into the ocean, we can get to these different, different areas and these, these um, aren't super important for us, but um, uh, Bathel, Abyssal and Hadal. So Hadal deriving from Hades, right? The, the, the deepest, darkest part of the ocean, the evil part of the ocean, supposedly. Um, that's where those terms come from. The uh, supratidal, uh, supratidal, I don't know, I can't speak today, intertidal and subtidal and immediate subtitle, shallow subtitle, we sometimes call it. Those are all part of the coastal system, or what we refer to as the littoral system. Uh, okay, then we can talk about stuff that's attached to the bottom. So that could be a, a, a worm living in the sediment, or it could be a barnacle that's, that's physically attached to a rock that's attached to the bottom, or it could be something like a crab that, is, that, that lives its life primarily crawling over 
mostly in contact with the bottom of the ocean. Those would all be benthic things or bottom associated things. In comparison, stuff that's not associated with the bottom would be something out in the pelagic realm. Okay, so, so no hard, rigid boundaries out there, right? That there are, there are in effect edges and structure and stuff, but no, no rocks as it were. Okay, and then we can talk about, um, I mentioned light, right? So we can talk about here's the air and then here's the bottom of the ocean. We could talk about going from the lighted regions down, 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 down deeper into essentially perennial blackness. Uh, the photic zone, photons, right, light, the photic zone is the area that light penetrates. Now, it depends on who we're talking to and, and what the context is. Um, we have different, um, different ways of segregating that light penetration. It'll affect color immediately within the first few meters going through the water. Uh, the color will change. So there's a qualitative change in the light. And concomitantly, the amount of energy that's in those photons will be changing because we're having different energetics going on there. And so the warmth, the ability of the sun to warm waters is strongest right at the surface of the ocean. The ability for uh, critters to see in full spectrum is greatest in the immediate few centimeters of the ocean. The ability for photosynthetic critters to photosynthesize it is restricted to the, the only really the upper film of the ocean. Uh, and so uh, much of what we're talking about is in the top 30 meters, but, um, but certainly uh, uh, as we go deeper, we start to get less um, um, efficient. There's less energy. And so pho um, autotrophs, things that are photosynthesizers have a harder and harder time. And eventually we're gonna to get to a point where they cannot produce any more, um, or, or, or it's, it's a, they're not able to produce a net photosynthate. So they're, they're um, not getting any benefit from photosynthesis. So below that zone, it's a, a photosynthetic deficit zone. And then we can go farther and then we can hit the area where we just don't get any light at all. And so, and so there's the photic zone, the lighted zone, and the aphotic zone or the dark zone where there's essentially no sunlight penetrating. And, and all this stuff, the aphotic zone, the abyssal, the hadal, we usually refer to those regions as the deep sea. So the last little bit of, of geography here or, or, or designation here is gonna be based on um, where critters live and how, the, how they, they live their life. So these are terms not for areas. So if we were talking about the bottom of the ocean, we would talk about the benthos, or is, is, uh, excuse me, the benthic region, right? The benthic region. If we're talking about the area in the open ocean, the pelagic region, okay? These terms here, these four terms are referring to living things. So these are names for living things based on where they live and how they do their, how they do their do, okay? So nuston are organisms that are right up at the, the air water interface. So think of a floating jellyfish or something of that nature. That would be nuston. Okay, then things that are in the water column primarily we can talk about two broad categories of things, plankton and nekton, or plankton and nekton. So plankton are organisms whose location is by and large dictated by the currents. So think of a single celled bacterium, okay? So this bacterium is sitting here and it's, it's floating around and then why is it here? It's here because the current sort of blew it over here, 
Okay. And in a few weeks, it's going to be, you know, maybe some miles down the coast or something because, or, 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 hundreds of kilometers down the coast, potentially, depending on the current, because it's getting blown and carried and, and, and drifting with the current uh, down to some other area. That would be an example of a planktonic organism. Okay, the other broad category would be things that are um, determining for themselves where they want to go. And so that would be fish, that would be whales, things of this nature. So. So when a whale wants to go somewhere, it's going to kick its flukes, you know, beat its flippers, and it's going to it's going to swim in a certain way. Now, it might sometimes, you know, go with the current because it might be easier to kind of surf with the water, but they don't have to go with the current. And, and indeed, we, we now know that some plankton, based on how they move, they can sort of move themselves into one current or another and in a sense, uh, sort of sail, if you will, around the ocean. But by and large, plankton are moved by the water mass itself, and nectin are moved by and large by where they want to go. Generally speaking, not exclusively, but generally speaking, plankton are small critters. Generally speaking, nekton are large critters. And then the last thing would just be um, uh, uh, organisms that are um, attached or or very closely associated with the bottom, and those would be benthos. Cool? So we have uh, all these different ways of, of differentiating things. If, is something more pelagic? Is something more benthic? Is something more uh, neuritic near shore? Is it more oceanic, far away from shore? Is this something that's associated, is this a critter that's associated with the skin of the ocean? Is this something that's, that's floating in the water? Uh, at, and just going with the flow, or is it able to swim, or is it associated with the bottom? Cool, make sense? Um, can I ask about proximate versus distal to an edge again? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so great. So we could talk about neuritic systems being proximal to the edge of the continent or, or, or near the land, let's say, versus oceanic. So that would be an example of that. We could also talk about uh, something uh, that is uh, associated with the bottom versus the open oceans. That would be more benthic versus more pelagic. Um, so yeah, so th those are those are two different ways of of doing that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Okay, all right. So uh, so great. So there we go. Let's take a quick uh, ten minute break. And we'll come back and um, uh, keep talking about uh, our introduction to the, the global ocean. So I'll, I'll start my timer and we'll come back in 10 minutes, you guys.